Hey, uh, in today's video, I wish to discuss a pretty important topic, at, uh, and that is mesh convergence. But instead of going very deeply into some mathematical, theoretical discussions, instead, I will show you on an actual example how to do mesh convergence, what it means, and why you really want to do mesh convergence. So basically, uh, in my blog, when subscribers send me questions, more often than not, uh, they will ask me about, is this mesh size correct? Like, should I have done it better? Maybe the elements should be smaller, maybe they should be bigger, maybe a completely different type of elements should be used. So uh, the biggest question here is um, whether or not I should use smaller elements. And there are drawbacks to that. Uh, and mostly those are uh, com in computing time, but also in the size of the analysis file you have to then store later on. So it's not, it's not a very obvious decision by any stretch of imagination. Uh, still, uh, smaller elements allow you to have more accurate outcomes in most cases. So uh, it's it's like in a balance and uh, of course you also need to decide whether you want to use the first order element second order elements or maybe even better so this is another consideration you need to have in mind uh, while uh, when selecting your mesh so in essence to uh, to answer the question all i could say is well you need to do a mesh convergence. Just select whatever output you are interested in. That most likely will be stress in some region that you are interested in your analysis. And then make the elements smaller and smaller. So you get more and more elements in your model. And then for each of those models, plot the outcome on a chart and see if the answer is converging as you increase the amount of elements. This doesn't always work. And uh, sometimes you simply have a stress singularity and it will never converge. Uh, you can check on my blog. There is an, an, an article about that. But in like most normal cases, um, uh, you would actually be able to, to pull this off. But how does it work and why does it work? Um, let's take a look on a pretty simple example. So this is a very simple plate cantilever that has a load at at the right edge and it's fixed on the on the left edge you can see the dimensions here and uh, we want to check how the outcomes will behave as we reduce the element size more and more but firstly before we start you need to often pay attention about boundary conditions in fea and this is not a different case it would seem to be super simplistic right it's just one fixed edge what could go wrong and yet um, you get a weird stress distribution because we would expect like a perfectly linear stress that increases the closer we are to the, the fixing point and you can see that the stress distribution actually isn't like that so uh, to fix that you would actually have to assume the boundary conditions on uh, on the along edges as i marked here because without that um the poison ratio kind of like uh, spoils the outcomes a bit and um, you get a weird stress distribution and since we want to verify this with hand calculations because it's always a good idea when you do FEA if you're able to of course um, then I decided to use the symmetry boundary condition so the outcome seems more natural uh, for us as uh, as engineers okay so the first candidate uh, for me always will be quad four and let's see how it goes so firstly I did a single element and I know that <laughs> this might not be the best approach but still uh, we have to start somewhere and actually when you do mesh convergence it's good to start with like a very big mesh because firstly the computing will take very quickly uh, and uh, that's a benefit but also it will give you a chance to to see how the outcome changes as you increase the amount of elements so here you see that for one element uh, we've got 150 megapascals. If I used three elements, it's uh, 250. And then as the uh, value increases, it gets closer and closer to 300 megapascals. If we would put that uh, on the chart, measuring the amount of elements along the 
edge, the long edge, and I, I try to keep them square. So, so it also reduces the size uh, in the perpendicular direction, as you can see here, but I'm measuring the along length amount of elements. You will see something like this. So looking at that, we can quite easily draw a conclusion that the answer is converging at 300 megapascals. It's quite, quite clear to see from the, uh, from the chart that the more elements we add, the closer we are to, uh, to 300 megapascals, and it's like almost look horizontal at the end, right? So let's check if the answer even makes sense, because like, you know, you could believe me, but it's far better to actually check yourself, isn't it? So this is a relatively simple case. The width of the cantilever is 0.2 meters. There are 10 kilonewtons per meter of load at the tip, which means that the total load is 2 kilonewtons. Bending moment would be this load times the, the arm, the length of the cantilever, so it's 1 kilonewton meter. Then the section modulus of the cross section is relatively easy to calculate, obviously, since we have all the data. And at the end, moment divided by section modulus gives us the, the stress, the normal stress from bending, and it is indeed 300 megapascals. So the FEA convergence study we did produced the correct answer, and this is what we are after. Right? So, uh, of course, this is how the bending moment and stress distribution look like on our beam, as you can see that the maximum value is 300 megapascals, so it fits nicely here, right? You could even say, well, we don't need so many elements because elements here are like kind of close enough, right? Like, you know, you don't always have to be like precisely on the spot unless you're doing something very specific, in which case you know that you have to. But uh, in most engineering cases, like being close enough is good, right? But Clearly, there are elements that were, that were way off, right? One, three elements along the edge, like the very beginning of the chart. Uh, it clearly shows that the answer is wrong. So let's wonder for a second why that is the case. Uh, you see, this is how the stress distribution looks like. And what quad four element does, it actually assumes that the stress is uniformly distributed throughout the surface of the element. So in some sense, it takes the average from the stress on the left side and on the right side in, in a very simple case like that, because like obviously you, you can have stresses in different directions and it gets more complicated. But as a general rule, right, um, it takes the stresses from one side and a second side, and simply make an average. So in reality, on the right we have zero, because it's a cantilever, and then on the left we have 300, so the average of that is 150, right? Uh, if we have two quad four elements, you could say that, okay, in the middle we have 150, on the right we have zero, the average in the element on the right will be 150 plus zero divided by two, that's 75 megapascals. And then uh, on the left, we have 300 on the left and in the middle is 150. So the element on the left, the average would be 225 megapascals. And that's also the outcome. And then with three quad elements, it works exactly the same. So um, this is why the more elements you use, the more accurate outcome you get, simply because the stress values on the small area of the element do not change that much. And since they do not change much, you're actually pretty decent because the average of almost constant value will all, almost be that value, right? So the more elements you have, the more accurate outcome you will get. So let's see how quad eight element will fare in this example. Quad eight elements uh, are quadratic elements, which means that they have additional nodes at the center lines of, of their edges, which makes the computing last longer, but they, they are also a bit more accurate. And you will see that regardless of the amount of elements, the answer is already correct. Uh, yeah. That's cool, huh? <laughs> um, so is quad eight element a clear winner? Well, no, not really. 
I mean, come on, if quad eight element would be so good, nobody would program any other element and I wouldn't be recording this video, right? It's just so happened that the cantilever problem we just solved was super favorable to quad eight elements and this is why they shine. So let's do something slightly different to show you how this really works. So this time our cantilever uh, is loaded with the uniform load. And of course, uh, I geared the example uh, in a way, I've selected the load in a way that in the end we get the same amount of stress, uh, simply so it's easier to remember. So it's 300 megapascals and you can see the calculations here. Uh, the difference here is that notice that uh, while the stress values at the tip are the same, the distribution of stress along the length is different. In the first example on the right, we had a linear stress distribution. Here it's a quadratic one because the load is uniformly distributed. So in this example, element quad four uh, still manages to converge to the proper solution. Although while you cannot see it here, this chart will show you that it actually struggles a bit more to converge because the uh, the second example is in orange and you can see that it kind of like needed more elements to, to converge to a decent value. Why that is? Well, we already discussed the mechanism. Uh, the only thing that changes is how the stress is distributed. So from which values we would take uh, the average. Of course, in case of one quad four element, we have 300 on the left, zero on the right, the average is 150. That's not, uh, that's not surprising. But if we do two quad four elements, the left one had 300 megapascals on the left and 75 megapascals in the middle, so on the right of the element, and the average of those is actually 187 and a half megapascals, right? And in case uh, where we have three quad four elements, again, the leftmost element has uh, 300 megapascals to the left, 133 megapascals to the right. So the average is again, uh, 216.7 megapascals. So as you can see, the quadratic stress distribution means that the stress values to the right of our elements are lower than they were uh, in case of uh, linear distribution. The average is not as favorable. So it's more difficult for uh, our elements to converge. And you could imagine, think about it uh, this way, that when the stress distribution is linear, it's actually easier to converge. So you require less elements to converge. And the bigger the local changes, like in this example, the, the local changes were bigger. The stress was relatively like lower, 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 and they're near the place where the stress reached 300 megapascals. The change in stress, local change was very big. So this means that you require more elements in that region uh, than in case of linear stress distribution. So let's see how quad eight element would look like. Uh, and uh, quad eight element is still way better than quad four, absolutely. Even with one element, it, it already gives you the answer of 250, which is quite decent, to be honest. With three elements, you're at like 294. That's like super close enough, right? So the convergence study looks like this. And uh, you can see how quickly the, the quad eight element converges, even with the quadratic stress. Uh, distribution throughout uh, our cantilever. So uh, what quad eight elements can do is that they, they do not expect the stress to be average throughout the area of the element. They, in they instead assume that the stress can linearly change through the area. So in case of the first example, it was perfectly spot on. The stress changed linearly. Our element could see that. So it produced a perfect outcome, even for a single element. And when the stress became quadratic in a second case, you could see uh, that there were small discrepancies because like you cannot model uh, uh, 
like quadratic function with only few straight lines. You need more of those to like nicely approximate the shape, right? But it's way easier to do that instead of using like horizontal short lines to, to, to draw the quadratic function, right? So uh, it's, it's way better this way. And at this stage, we should say, all right, so who is the winner? And it might seem that quad eight elements are simply better. And to that, I would say that if you could only use so many elements in your model for whatever reason, then yeah, quad eight will always be more accurate. That's no doubt. However, usually it's the time that it's of an essence, because what you pay for the quad eight element accuracy, mostly with computing time. It simply takes a lot longer to calculate your model when you are using quad eight elements. And the trade-off is, do I want, not do I want to use a thousand quad four elements or a thousand quad eight elements? Like that's no comparison, quad eight elements will be better. The trade-off is, if I use as many quad four elements to converge a decent outcome, if I use fewer quad eight elements to produce the outcome of the same quality, which of those models will compute faster? This is the choice you're making. And actually quad eight elements aren't the obvious winner there. While you don't need as many, they compute so much longer that it's not obvious by any means that quad eight will win. Of course, there are no simple answers. Sometimes quad four, more quad four elements are better, sometimes fewer quad eight elements compute faster. And the best approach here is that you could really simply select a model that nicely represents whatever you are doing in FEA most often, and just do the mesh convergence as I showed you here for your typical problem using linear elements, quadratic elements, see how accurate the answer you obtain is, like change the mesh size, and then see how quickly those models compute. And thanks to such an analysis that you only need to do like once for each set of problems, um, you can say, okay, in this particular case, it's easier or more beneficial, let's say, to use this particular type of element. And the answer is never simple. And also if someone is doing something else in FEA and comes to you and say, hey, um, you're doing, I don't know, a beam structures and I do like shell structures and I always use quadratic elements because they are better. His conclusion or hers may not be correct in your case because this depends on what type of problems you are solving in FEA. And you should be very careful about that. So it's best to do your own mesh convergence study and use that as a guidance to whatever you wish to do. Uh, so to wrap it up, what every FEA wizard should remember is that you simply cannot ignore mesh size. And I think like this is the biggest thing I should point out here. I, I've seen such bizarrely meshed models that people try to treat as final, that it's it's incredible. So you don't want to be there. Remember that uh, too few quad four elements produced as stupid results as two, two times lower stresses. And this can be even worse depending on the case. So be careful, never simply ignore mesh size. This is not a thing you could ignore. And of course, problems with mesh convergence get worse in regions where stresses changes fast. If you have like a relatively simple element with a very smooth stress distribution, uh, then mesh convergence may not be as critical in your case. However, every time the stress abruptly change because something is connecting to something else, for instance, then you really need to pay attention to mesh size in those regions because it's very easy to kind of like omit the stress peak that's there, that is actually natural and will happen, right? So all kinds of cantilevers and connections of those type of elements uh, really, really require your attention when you do uh, analysis. Uh, of course, it's best to do your own mesh convergence for your typical model and just see which type of elements give you the best accuracy in the shortest computing time. And when you will be armed with this knowledge, your FEA will be on such a higher level because not only you will know how small elements you need to produce a decent outcome, you will also know which type of element to choose that is simply most beneficial in your case. Uh, and in the end, I think, 
uh, I hope at least that I managed to show you that understanding stuff actually is cool. Like I like understanding things and this is why I shoot videos, make courses and so on. Uh, and um, I would really encourage you to try to understand more from FEA, engineering and all that. It, it really... It really helps with work, but it also gives you a tremendous pleasure, I hope. And um, if you would like to learn more about FEA, uh, you definitely have to check my um, 10x FEA course. It sums up the biggest 10 lessons I've learned in a decade of doing industrial FEA. And you can find this course um, in the link that I will provide below this video. Um, I hope that you like it. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below the video and I will be sure to check those from time to time and leave an answer. Thank you for watching and see you next time.